I don't know how I would have felt if a Jedi was really behind this. There are going to be Jedi who disappoint us, Ahsoka. Will I still become one with the Force when I die? Padawan. Padawan. I will help you. But you must answer one question. You have but to ask. What's up, meta nerds? Welcome back to part three of the complete life of Ahsoka Tano. Previously, we saw her birth, rise through the Jedi Order as the Padawan of the Chosen One. She would better understand the complexities of the Clone Wars, and move beyond space-time itself in the realm of the Ones. With Anakin performing an essence transfer from the embodiment of the Ashla, the light side, now we will see how the galaxy grew darker toward the end of the war, destroying her relationship with the Jedi Order, forcing her into hiding, and running from the Sith monster that killed Anakin Skywalker. At this point in the war, the CIS was gaining greater control over the Inner Rim, one key world was Onderon, which was being ruled by a king that many saw as just a separatist puppet. Lux Bonteri was now dedicating himself to helping rebel groups that wanted to stay independent from both the CIS and Republic. Saw Guerrero would contact the Jedi Order, and their request for aid was shot down. Outwardly, their king was rightly in power, and the Republic says they could not get involved. But as the message ends, Lux makes sure to lock eyes with Ahsoka. Skywalker opened this up for debate, saying that they don't have to openly support them, just provide training and arms, and help them take out soft targets in the city. Yoda and Kenobi know that this is another word for terrorism, operations that would likely get innocents killed. Mace was actually in agreement with Skywalker, but Ahsoka is troubled by this line of reasoning. What you're suggesting would open up dangerous possibilities, and we must not train terrorists. Uh, rebels. It was only after Anakin's suggestion that they bring EMP-style weapons, which could only harm droids, that the Council reluctantly agreed, though Kenobi would oversee them. Navigating through the dense jungles under cover of night, the rebels detect them and Ahsoka makes the introduction. I'm Commander Tano. We're here to help you take back your planet. They bring the Jedi back to their secret camp and get to work training this ragtag group. Ahsoka is happy to be seeing Lux again, but it is clear that he and the rebel leader, Stila, have something going on as well. Good to see you again. Well, what matters now is we need each other's help, just like we did on Karlak. Karlak? What happened on Karlak? The rebels have a separatist armored assault tank in their possession. It's unclear if it's still functional, but it at least works as a great way to practice learning how to best scale this vehicle and how to attack the right sections. And Rex would help teach them how to get droid poppers past the energy shield of the droidica. Saw Gerrera thought Lux was just a wimpy politician, not a warrior, but when Ahsoka threw him an EMP grenade, he doesn't let her down. Hmm, nice touch. When Stila is having trouble as well, Ahsoka is forced to watch as Bon Terry gets close with her and shows her the right moves. And to further complicate this love square, Saw Gerrera takes a liking to the Togruta, asking for his own personal lessons. But the rebels were picking things up quickly, though the king's spies were always watching. Confirming the location of this hidden rebel base, droid units are mobilized. During sniper practice, Stila spots a droid wave descending on them. With some accurate shooting, and Lux and Saw employing Ahsoka's anti-tank tactic, they were able to win the day. But now the base was revealed, so they would take the fight to the city. And Lux comes up with the idea of smuggling their arms and forces past the ray shield by acting like they were traveling merchants. The droids allow the rebels in, and when Lux departs, we see how Ahsoka and Stila are both worried about him. Good luck. You too. Over the following days, we see how the Jedi are concealed in their robes and watching over the rebels as they take out numerous droid patrols across the city. While up in the palace, King Rash is trying to think of a way to crush this insurgency, calling the previous king out from his prison cell to demand that he call off these attacks. But the old man swears that he has nothing to do with this uprising. This was just a natural response to the Separatists' ever-increasing military presence. Enraged, the king sends his predecessor back to his cell. When the rebels hide out in the capital, they discuss the plan to hit a larger target, something that would show the Separatists were not as powerful as they appear. With a plan to hit the droid's power supply, Kenobi says the Jedi advisors had served their purpose, that they will leave, but will continue to supply credits and weaponry, as well as leave Ahsoka to stay on as an advisor for a bit longer. After scouting the power facility, they agree that they will need some serious firepower to blow their way in. Later that night, an ambush is set up in the streets to lure in a solution, resulting in the largest firefight of this conflict, with B1s, B2s, Droidicas, and eventually an AAT showing up to try and stop these rebels. But with their Republic training, and a bit of their own improvising, they were able to secure their big gun. Steela would jump in to get it all working again, and turn it over to Saul, who would pilot it while she and Ahsoka moved into a sniping position. 
the droid numbers are greater than anticipated, forcing the Jedi to activate her blades and deflect some incoming bolts. If spotted, this could be a bad look for the Republic. It would be used as proof that the Republic was not allowing worlds to make their own choices in the Clone Wars, but meddling in their internal affairs to topple legal CIS-supporting governments. Saul would be able to blast the doors down, and then fire on the main reactor, causing an enormous discharge of electrical energy that could be seen across the entire city. In the palace, King Rash is actually inspired by this loss, saying that this move signed the Rebels' death warrant, but at least for tonight, the rebellion would celebrate, as the streets were cleared of droid patrols to the soundtrack of cheering civilians. Come here, you handsome senator. Ahsoka is finding it hard to stand this open romance between Stila and Lux, and they make the call back to the Jedi to report their victory. While Kenobi is speaking to the rebels, Anakin talks to Ahsoka on the side, knowing exactly what was going on with her. That she had feelings for this boy, and despite this being against the Jedi Code, her master did not reprimand her at all. To her surprise, he says he knows how hard it is to ignore these feelings. I understand. You do? I do. But try to remember. Always put purpose ahead of your feelings. And if she thought about it, this likely would have confirmed what she had seen and suspected about her master and Senator Padme. During the celebration, they would elect Stila as the group's leader. Saul was upset, and only at this moment did Ahsoka learn that these two were siblings, all while King Rash was calling on Dooku to send more support. The following days would see an escalation in force by both parties, larger numbers of droids, and more bold strikes by the rebels. A debate breaks out in the palace over the loyalties of the Onderon military and the holdovers from the previous king. The tactical droid General Kalani calls out General Tandon, who swears that these rebels are in no way aided by the military or anyone else as far as he can tell. But Rash still believes the old king was behind this somehow, and orders a public execution. When the rebels hear the news, Saul defies his superior's orders. Lux and Ahsoka try to reason with him, but he heads out to try and free King Denda. I sense fear in you, Ahsoka. The rebels are divided. If they try to rescue the king now, I'm afraid we might lose them. Saul would be able to make it to the old king, but a one-way shield trapped them. And when she hears the news that the execution was scheduled with a plus one, Stila says their rescue must still focus on Denda. We don't have time or the bodies to do both. Purpose must come before feelings. Words that hit Lux particularly hard. A crowd would gather to watch the execution. Stila's plans go off perfectly sniping the IG-100 executioners, Lux deploying the smoke grenades, and the rebels rescuing both Saw and the King. But B2 droid allies under the command of Kalani are able to encircle them, forcing these rebels to drop their blasters, and the execution now continues. In one afternoon, the entire leadership of the rebellion could be wiped out. The crowd starts to turn against King Rash, but they were too scared to act. Ahsoka was rushing towards the platform, about to defy her orders from the council and openly attack the droids and CIS-aligned King. But just then, General Tandon rushes in with loyal guards to arrest the new king for treason against Onderon. Grabbing King Rash and using him as a living shield, Tandon is able to prevent the droids from shooting in the direction of the fleeing rebels. But now the general would have to face the rest of the droids. Things look bleak, but Ahsoka reasoned that with the general's defection and the civilians siding against Rash, all of this allowed her to intervene. Clearly, the Jedi were not usurping a legitimate government, but helping to fight off someone that the natives considered a CIS puppet. The droids were easily destroyed, and she tells the general to come with her, while the mob rushes the king and his bodyguards. Back in the hideout, Ahsoka and Lux get some time alone. I knew you couldn't resist a good fight. Am I becoming that predictable? Only to me. Later, she would speak with her master, who says that despite the Onderonian general's defection, he still isn't sure if the council would provide official aid. The following day, the rebels are ecstatic to see their movement was spreading throughout the city, prompting Saul to recommend that they turn this into a firefight in the capital to completely drive off the droids. But Ahsoka and everyone else disagrees, citing that this will endanger the civilians, that they should instead attack the droids on the outskirts to draw them into the mountains. The rightful king puts Stila in charge, and as they depart, she gives Lux Bonteri a kiss, while Ahsoka is forced to watch on and act like she was happy for him. In the palace, Kalani summons HMP droid gunships, a new droid gunship that he promises will help end this insurgency once and for all. The droid units were easily taken out, but once the gunships showed up, they did turn the tide of the battle, raining down death with their laser cannons and missiles, while also being unstoppable with their ray shielding. Any ideas? Yeah, run! Commando droids swoop in and quickly eliminate squads of rebels, while Ahsoka ducked behind cover to make contact with her master. It's a full-scale war! They need our help! Anakin is furious that Kenobi would just allow these rebels to die. 
Ahsoka had already revealed that a Jedi was helping, it made no sense for the Council to turn their backs. Obi-Wan argues that this is a galactic war, and this just happens sometimes. But Skywalker knows a way that they can help take down this new droid gunship without it looking like it came from the Republic. Anakin heads to Florum to purchase rocket launchers from the Pirate King Hondo Onaka. He would deliver them to the Rebels, and as soon as they were in their possession, Saul rushes out and shoots down an HMP. Newly inspired, the Rebels fall back to the caverns, drawing the rest of the droid forces into a trap. More gunships would be destroyed, and Stila was able to save the King's life from the pursuing commando droids. Saul would fire on the final droid gunship, landing a hit that would send it spiraling out of control. But as the Force would have it, the craft flew right at the cliff where Stila and the King were standing. As the rock face starts to collapse, she pushes the King to safety, leaving herself dangling over the edge. Lux rushes to help, but he loses his footing and starts to fall. Ahsoka is able to call on the Force to get him to safety, and then turns to save Stila. Hovering in the air, Ahsoka can almost touch her fingers when the HMP flickers to life, attacks the target, and fires. The bolt striking Ahsoka and breaking her connection. Lux destroys the droid as quickly as possible, but Ahsoka turns back to the cliff. She sees it was too late. Saw and Bon Terry look on as this woman they loved, the inspiring leader of these rebel forces, lay dead on the ground below. In the palace, Quilani tells Dooku about the loss of so many of these elite gunships, an indication that the rebels had grown too powerful. This world was not worth further CIS investment, so Dooku gave the order to have King Rash executed. With a single shot fired by Kalani in the order of a full retreat, the rebels were left to take back the capital. A re-coronation of the rightful king was held, and an enormous funeral for Stila Guerrera, who was both the moral leader and battlefield general of these rebel forces. Her people knew that their freedom was because of her, something Saul and Bon Terry took solace in. Skywalker and Kenobi would also be in attendance, and note how difficult this mission was for Ahsoka. Testing her abilities to deny her own romantic feelings, lead a war from the shadows, and show great discretion and self-control in this politically complicated environment. This has been quite a journey for our Padawan. And she not only helped Stila and the rebel movement, but her actions have convinced Bon Terry as well. And after watching your heroics and the selflessness of the Jedi, I do believe the Republic is the right side to be on. Her next mission was intended to give Ahsoka some well-learned time away from the battlefront, but it would also find new ways to challenge the Padawan. Time of the Gathering. For a Jedi, there is no greater challenge or honor. The time has come for you to build your own lightsabers. They would head to the ancient Jedi world of Ilum, the icy home of the Kyber Crystals, which are at the core of the Jedi weapon. The first trial would be to focus on the Force and reveal the opening to the ancient temple. Inside, Yoda would explain the trial, and cause a beam of light to melt away the ice blocking the door. Each of the younglings would be tested in ways that were specific to their unique shortcomings, being fearful, doubtful, impatient, and cocky. But like countless Jedi before them, they received their crystals and couldn't wait to start building their lightsabers. On the Crucible, a ship that dates back to the time of the Old Republic, they meet Professor Hu Yang, the droid that has guided younglings throughout this process for over a millennia. They were all excited to get to building, but the professor points out that this is a process that will test their patience and precision in the Force. The droid would walk them through the technical side, while Ahsoka tried to get them in the right mindset. Quiet your mind and concentrate. The design will become clear. The way sacred rite of passage in the life of a Jedi, to pirates like Hondo Onaka, they only saw credits to be made. Stating that just a single Kyber crystal would make a man incredibly rich, their unique disc frigate swoops in, firing a barrage of rockets, then enormous grapple hooks, bringing the Crucible in close as the pirates perform a spacewalk to guide the boarding tubes. The Jedi hide from the boarding party and Ahsoka makes a plan, telling them to stay in the vault while she works to clear the ship. But they were quickly intercepted, using an improperly assembled lightsaber as a bomb, and setting all the training droids on the highest power setting. Still, their numbers were too great. Luckily, Ahsoka would return from repairing the engines to save the day, taking out several pirates, but when it came to Hondo, she didn't want to kill the man that just helped save the rebels on Onderon, and who was growing to become just an overall unlikely Jedi asset. I don't want to hurt you, Hondo! I know, and, and I appreciate that. Still, he and his friends had to go. With the younglings in the cockpit, she orders them to engage the engines, ripping them from the pirate boarding tube, and creating a vacuum that was sucking them into space. Ahsoka was able to send them all back to their flagship, but just as she was about to close the doors, a pirate crashes into her, and the pair go tumbling toward the entire pirate army. 
Ahsoka had given the command to jump to hyperspace, but was now captive on a Corona class. The younglings contact the nearest Republic forces, which happen to be Kenobi and the 212th. He instructs them to stay put, and that Cody was on the way. That despite the fact that the pirate base on Florum was near their location, they cannot risk their lives on a rescue mission. But a CIS fleet emerges from hyperspace to engage Kenobi's forces. The younglings' rescue is delayed, giving them enough time to finish constructing their lightsabers. And they quickly grow restless, knowing they could use their new weapons to save Ahsoka. It would be wise if you would let me go. No, it would be unprofitable. Hondo was already envisioning all the credits he would receive with this catch. While Kenobi was suffering an incredible defeat, droid fighters, bombers, and gunships were ripping the Republic forces apart, culminating in Grievous dueling the Master in the hangar of Kenobi's flagship, the Negotiator. This battle would force Obi-Wan to set his flagship to self-destruct. I'm afraid the younglings are now on their own. Meanwhile on World, the younglings discover a traveling circus that was to entertain the pirate horde. Using their Jedi acrobatics to pass as performers, they are able to join the show. After the opening act, the younglings spot Ahsoka's blades on Hondo's belt. Their impromptu performance entertains the whole crowd, though the Padawan sees right through it. With some sleight of hand, the blades are removed, while the rest use the seesaw to send the pirate king flying. The gig was up, and with a free to Soka, they used the circus vehicle to race back to the Crucible. I could pretend to be angry, but you are all very brave. I've learned from my master that sometimes doing the right thing means bending the rules. With the pirates in hot pursuit, the cruiser was able to position itself over them while Ahsoka was deflecting the bolts with her dual sabers. But the incoming fire was too great, and the terrain too perilous forcing the transport and cruiser to pull away. They were nearly able to make it aboard, before a bolt right into the engine sends the crew tumbling out. Her lightsaber separated from her, Ahsoka, the younglings, and even the droid Professor are captured. The pirates are happy with their catch, but cannot believe their eyes when they return to the base. A full planetary invasion was underway, with CIS dropships, tanks, troop transports, and even Grievous. The general storms into the throne room of the Pirate King, roughing up the weak way, before introducing the scum to his new master. We learn that Dooku provided the information that led to the younglings' capture, but Hondo wished to sell Ahsoka to the highest bidder and not contact Dooku directly. The Count decided to end his reign, scrapping or destroying all of the pirates' arms, ammunition, and vehicles, while Ahsoka was trying to bargain with her captors, saying that they could sneak back and free Hondo, allowing them to escape via a secret stash of ships. I know Grievous. And I know droids. With my help, you stand a better chance. Once they make it inside, Hondo quickly flips back to being a friend of the Jedi, and their combined forces were able to push through the droid ranks. The younglings getting their first droid kills, and making off with speeder bikes and a light tank. Hondo would make it to his concealed hangar, and depart via the repaired Slave 1, while the rest of the Jedi were pursued by Grievous. Cornered, Ahsoka held the cyborg off long enough for them to make a run for it. Still unable to best him, she has to settle for a successful escape on the vessel that Ahsoka once thought she had destroyed. They are able to make their way to Kenobi and his new fleet, where Hondo avoids the whole kidnapping part of the story, focusing more on the rescue from Grievous. Obi-Wan knows this wild card is better left in the deck, just in case they ever need him in the future. And Ahsoka is able to congratulate the Padawans on what had become a very unconventional trip to Ilum. Quite an eventful mission. The most eventful since the time Master Yoda went to find his lightsaber crystal. As if to show just how much Ahsoka had grown over these years, she would go from guiding younglings to saving her master's life with some expert piloting of her own. Look out! Incoming missiles! The Separatists were launching an invasion of the planet Cato Nymordia. Tri-Droid fighters would launch a Discord missile to explode in front of their Eta 2s, releasing a cloud of buzz droids. Anakin tried to play it cool, and was able to seemingly clear all of them off, but a small explosion knocked him unconscious. Ahsoka has R2 tip the wing to see if there were any more on the ventral side, revealing a complete infestation. She knew there was no way to save the ship, and has to trust her astromech R7 to communicate with R2, having them land the ships while she leaps over to free her master. R7! <laughs> Take over the ship. I'm going after Anakin. Somebody has to save his skin. Her knowledge of these fighters, faith in the droids, and her athleticism allowed her to get Anakin safely to the ridge. Now conscious, her master was eager to get back into the fight, but they got a call from Yoda, saying that the Jedi Temple had been bombed, that they must return to Coruscant immediately. As they get their mission briefing, we see that Ahsoka is in utter disbelief that a Jedi could do this. Leave a Jedi would attack a place this sacred. But as they make their way to the bombed hangar, Anakin tells Ahsoka that this idea is not so unbelievable. It isn't even unheard of. Both Dooku and Krell were just the most recent of Jedi defectors. Ahsoka, there are many political idealists among us. 
When she and the detective droid made their rounds in the medical wing, asking all the survivors what they saw, one Pantoran had a clue, saying that a maintenance man in the hangar named Jakar Bomani was the last one in the area before the explosion. Anakin is confused how anyone could sneak in an explosive and goes to speak with Temple Security. He sees that there is a large group forming on the steps, protesting what they saw as the Jedi dragging the Republic into war. After all, the Clone Wars was being fought with Jedi Generals against a fallen Jedi Master. When he is showing the security head the hollow of the suspect, Jakar's wife steps forward from the crowd, saying she has not heard from him and feared he had died in the blast. She is furious that Anakin could even suspect her husband of bombing the temple, a man who loved the Jedi Order and who passed all the Jedi's rigorous tests just to be allowed to work there. Back in the hangar, Ahsoka is searching through the three-dimensional hologram recording of this area. Her and the detective are trying to find the source, but finding no residue from an explosive device. At last, the detective finds microscopic droids that cover some of the material that was blown away from the epicenter. By scanning the remains of all the victims, they find these same nanodroids concentrated in the bloodstream of only one sample. Because he was the bomb. The Jedi rush off to Jakar's home, scanning for any trace of these incredibly rare devices. Ahsoka finds evidence in the food, but the wife has no trace within her. Anakin thinks he has solved this mystery, and as they head back to the temple to detain his wife, Leta makes a break for it, being surprisingly athletic herself, coasting through the alleyways on various speeders, but there was no way she was escaping Ahsoka, the Padawan pouncing on her prey and laying into the traitor. Though we should note what Ahsoka was most outraged by. People blamed Jedi because of you. People were killed because of you! The first thing that comes to mind is how this woman was willing to tarnish the name of the Jedi. To shake everyone's faith in the Order, her concern for the lives lost came second. But this root of Ahsoka's concern was mirrored just a few minutes later, with the plot revealed and led her behind bars. The Padawan confides in her master that if it was what the Council had suspected, that a Jedi orchestrated this bombing, it would shake her view of the Order. I don't know how I would have felt if a Jedi was really behind this. There are going to be Jedi who disappoint us, Ahsoka. She is stunned by this, pausing to take it all in before catching up with her master. Yoda would conduct a eulogy for those lost during the attack, with the most notable figures in the Order, the Grand Army of the Republic, and Senate all in attendance. After the ceremony, Anakin, Tarkin, Ahsoka, and Barriss are walking together, discussing what was being done with Leta. We see the old rivalry between Tarkin and Ahsoka bubbling up, livid that he is so arrogantly taking over command of this investigation. What was even more frustrating was that Anakin sided with the military man, saying that since clones were killed, and Leda is a Republic citizen, not a Jedi, the military courts would deal with her. Barris dismisses herself, and Anakin sees that the Padawan wants to comfort her friend. Be with your friend, Ahsoka. <sighs> In ways she is still very young. Indeed. Barris is troubled by this whole incident, saying that in times like this, the Jedi Code seems to fall short. Have you ever wondered if it was right to ignore your emotions? Our struggle as Jedi is to move past them. You've always been capable of seeing things clearly. <laughs> I guess I fooled you like I have everyone else. Barris is still shaken, and we see that Ahsoka knows she is not always able to deny her natural reactions to things, that they will continue to refine this self-denial over a lifetime as Jedi Knights. Ahsoka rushed to the meeting room to hear the next mission briefing, but Tarkin interrupts, stating that Leto will only speak with Ahsoka Tano. Everyone else is confused, but she is eager to assist in the investigation. Arriving at the Naval Intelligence Headquarters, she passes layer after layer of clone security. Commander Fox congratulates her on the capture, but once they escort the Jedi to the prison cell, he overhears a very odd statement by Leto. Told if I ever needed help, you were the Jedi to contact. Ahsoka first thinks this woman is lying trying to pass off the blame to some mysterious Jedi that gave her the nanobots. But Leta sees that she was used, and when she finally starts to tell Ahsoka the name of the Jedi traitor, the prisoner is force choked and lifted off her feet. Ahsoka is panicked, but there's no way to stop this. She just watches as Leta was suffocated to death. Fox and the Coruscant guard were watching the whole thing on surveillance video and rushed into the cell. I can't say I blame you, Commander Tano, but all the same, you're under arrest. Padawan pleads her innocence, but is thrown behind ray shields all the same. Tarkin arrives with an infuriating air of victory and righteous superiority. He always doubted this child, and now he had irrefutable footage of her cover-up, killing the bomber before she could reveal how Ahsoka planned this attack and supplied the nanobots. It seems the Jedi she was afraid of was you. As soon as Anakin was informed, he tried forcing his way past the clones to free his Padawan. But seeing Commander Fox was not going to budge, he found a way to let go of his anger. When Ahsoka wakes up, she sees a key card was conveniently placed just outside her cell. Master, 
I knew you wouldn't let me down. Using the force to manipulate the access panel, she was now free to try and solve this mystery on her own. But around the very first corner, she sees a room full of incapacitated clones. And then she finds her lightsabers and calm on the floor. She's utterly confused, while Fox rushes in and sounds the alarm. Rex and Skywalker were informed and race back to the base, while the little one was calling on all of her training to evade the base security. Flipping through the closing series of blast doors and sprinting down the halls, she sees dead clones all cut through with a lightsaber, and knows someone was doing everything they could to set her up. Her master and close friend arrive just in time to hear Fox give an order to execute Tano on sight, but Rex would not allow that. I know Commander Tano. She would never do something like this. And Anakin desperately pleads with her to come back. Someone's setting me up. I believe you, Ahsoka. But no one else will. The chase would bring her across the entire Naval Intelligence headquarters and out to the fuel depot. Being chased by LAAT gunships, raining down volley after volley of stun bolts, she is pushed to her physical limits, but able to avoid fire until the very end. Encircled by troopers and gunships, her master calls out, begging her to turn herself in. Perhaps she considered it, but ultimately she could not. Calling on the Force to send her in a great leap onto one of the tubes, cutting her way in, and making her way into the labyrinth of sewage tunnels. The clones were scattered, but Anakin pauses to connect with her through the Force. Alone, he would make his way to her. You didn't even try to come and help me. They wouldn't let me in to talk to you. You could have if you tried. You need to come back and make your case to the Council. Anakin, you have to trust me now. Rex would rush towards them, along with the clone guards. Ahsoka would lock eyes with her devastated master as she jumps down into the lower levels of Coruscant. While the little one was on her own, the Council meets to discuss the next steps. Plo Koon, the man that saved and discovered Ahsoka at the age of three, is devastated by this situation. I do not believe that Ahsoka could have fallen so far. But the evidence appears very clear. Tarkin and the military are searching for the fugitive, and most of the Council is convinced of her treason as well. Yoda commands Plo and Anakin to form a search team, but Mace disagrees. Master Skywalker and Master Plo Koon, with clones, you will go. He's emotionally tied to her. Probably too emotional to do what needs to be done. Though Yoda certainly understands Mace's concern, this may be the ultimate test being put forward by the Force. Overcoming this fear of loss was the reason Yoda paired Anakin with Ahsoka in the first place. He knows he must let this play out, and see how Skywalker holds up. Down in the lower levels, we see that the Underworld Police have her image posted everywhere, and are scouring the streets. Not sure who to trust, she makes a call to Barriss. Her friend is happy to hear from her, but tells Ahsoka to lay low and avoid the Jedi comms. She would try to blend in, but this wasn't exactly her forte. And with wanted posters digitally plastered on every level, a bounty hunter had already spotted her, ambushing the Padawan and overwhelming her, igniting two crimson blades that come close to Ahsoka's neck. Ventress, the once apprentice to Count Dooku, who had been betrayed by her master after a single command by Sidious, an assassin that was once herself a Jedi Padawan, was now operating as a bounty hunter. It made sense to Ahsoka that only someone like Ventress could have been devious enough to think up this complex plan to frame her. But as they walked, she could sense that the fallen Sith was telling the truth. After catching her up on the bombing incident, Ventress takes great joy in seeing this feud within the Order. So the Jedi aren't that holy after all. And Ahsoka leveraged Ventress's want for revenge, and knows that the assassin would like to return to a relatively normal life. I'll get you a full pardon for your crimes. Just as she agrees, Republic forces descend on them, and they are forced to make a run for it, with Anakin pulling up in time to see a troubling sight, his Padawan allied with Ventress, denying any part of himself that could start to see her as a traitor. Ventress would be on the lookout while Ahsoka made the call to Barriss to see if she had any information. Her friend was able to give her the location of the warehouse that contains these rare nanodroids. Three levels up, there seems to be an abandoned warehouse, where they used to build munitions that let have visited during the time she was getting access to the nanodroids. How did you find this out? But just then, the clone troopers swarm them. It doesn't look good, but the Padawan is able to convince Ventress not to kill them. Instead, it would be a flurry of kicks and lightsaber strikes their DC-15s that subdued the squads and allowed for their escape. When she makes it to the warehouse, the two head their separate ways. As Ventress made her way down to the trash-strewn alleys, she is ambushed by a cloaked figure, hitting her with the 50-gallon drum and then smacking her in the head with a pipe, before taking her sabers and bounty hunter mask. The being would then rush to the warehouse to take the fight to Ahsoka. Ventress! 
I see you've had a change of heart. The battle would be intense with a relentless barrage of red blades. The fight started taking down the whole building, eventually resulting in an explosion that could be seen across the city. The local police spot it, and the Jedi strike team pick up the radio call, flying over in their LAATLEs. Ahsoka was defeated by the hooded assailant, and fell into the storage area, where Republic forces would make their arrest. No! Wolf, let me explain! With the Padawan unconscious and restrained, they made their way back to the Jedi Temple. Plo has to report to the Council that little Soka was found with the very same nanobots that were used during the temple bombing. Things were looking even worse, but some details also didn't make sense. It still doesn't explain Ventress's involvement. We saw her with Ahsoka. I think there's more going on than we know. Back in the temple, it is Tarkin who makes the demand that Ahsoka be expelled by the Order, so that they could conduct what would be seen as a more fair trial. Obi-Wan says they should all stick with her and deny this request, but everyone else from Sacy Tin to Windu to Yoda all agree the evidence is too strong and the risk for bias too obvious. Before they make a decision, they summon Master and Apprentice. How plead you? Not guilty, Master. The question is, Padawan Tano, who is deceiving us, Ventress, you, or someone else? I am not deceiving you! Despite hearing her explanation, the Council has made their decision against her. She will be expelled from the Jedi Order. You can't do this! And it is Kayati Mundi that reads her official expulsion from the Jedi Order. This fall, you are barred from the Jedi Order. She would be transferred over to Republic authorities, though her master and her lawyer Padme would be able to visit her. Ahsoka retells the story of her run-in with Ventress, and Anakin knows that if this is the only lead, he has to try and find the assassin in the lower levels. After her master leaves, Padme tries to comfort the Padawan, who over these years had become something of an adoptive child to them. But everyone except Anakin has abandoned me. Ventress still didn't have her lightsabers, and with Anakin full of rage, the fight was a short one. Force choking her, and actually gripping his hands around her neck, Ventress sees this was no time to play coy. She reveals everything she knows. Your Padawan contacted the temple. She spoke to someone named... Barris. In Naval Intelligence HQ, Tarkin makes his opening statements. When you are found guilty, I ask the court that the full extent of the law be brought down upon you, including penalty of death. Padme points out that Leto was afraid of a Jedi, and it makes no sense for Ahsoka to kill someone by way of the Force when she knew the room was being monitored. Anakin heads to the temple, and in the chambers of Barris Afi, one of Ahsoka's closest friends, the Padawan that she saved back on Geonosis, and again from the Brain Worms, whom she had grown up with together in the Jedi Temple, she was the Jedi traitor. Anakin would strike at Barris with her own saber, forcing her to call Ventress's blade into her hands. The fight would provoke Skywalker to pull from the dark side as he pursued her through the temple, and bashed her defenses down with overwhelming blows, utterly destroying her will in the Force, catching her midair, choking her, and smashing her against the great tree. Back in the trial, Palpatine was about to read the verdict. Overwhelming count of Chancellor. I am here with evidence and a confession. Accepting her fate, Barriss scolds the Jedi for their involvement in the war, which she believes to have been created by a Sith Lord forcing the Jedi to be in effect agents of evil, dragging the galaxy into darkness while claiming the moral high ground. The Jedi are the ones responsible for this war. That we've so lost our way that we have become villains in this conflict. Anakin is filled with joy and relief at seeing Ahsoka freed, but though exonerated, the Padawan still seems troubled. They return to the Jedi Temple, where the Council is also incredibly happy to have her back. Her friend and Jedi savior Plo Koon opening up first. You have our most humble apologies, little Soka. This was actually your great trial. Back into the Order, you may come. They're asking you back, Ahsoka. I'm asking you back. To everyone else, this whole issue was behind them now. Just one great Jedi trial placed here by the Force. But to Ahsoka, this was much bigger than just the case of the temple bombing. As we saw when the investigation started, she was most shaken by the idea of the Jedi Order being tainted. Knowing that what the Order meant to her, how she conceived of it in her mind, was not how it was in reality. Certainly not how the Separatists saw them, and they were even disdained by many citizens and military officials within the Republic. This incident made real for Ahsoka the idea that even a Jedi could come to hate the Order, seeing it not just as flawed, but as actively making the galaxy worse. Her idealized view was shattered when the Council abandoned her so quickly, to their own admission, a decision that was influenced by politics, not wanting to look biased in this time of war. For all these reasons, Ahsoka knew that this was just the beginning of a new trial. 
Perhaps it was one placed on her by the Force itself, but one meant to lead her to eventually transcend the Jedi Order. But right now, she would have to do something that would shatter her master's soul. I'm sorry, Master, but I'm not coming back. Skywalker has to speak with her further, but notice that Plo Koon holds Kenobi back from running after him, and Ahsoka shakes his head in despair, knowing that this attempt to help Anakin overcome his fear of loss had backfired. The Council's wisdom did not make a Padawan that would come to respect the Jedi Order's chain of command. They pushed her away from the Order completely, and Skywalker would not learn to let go of his fears and trust the Order. He would never forgive them for turning their back on his Padawan. Her goodbye shows just how close these two had become. So many unspoken understandings. Earlier we saw that she was aware of the secret love between him and Padme, and she even knew of his deeply concealed thoughts of leaving the Order himself. More than you realize, I understand wanting to walk away from the Order. I know. There was nothing more to say. A tear falls down her cheek as she walks away from the only life she ever knew. And while Tano started out in her new life, alone in this crazy war-torn galaxy, Yoda was deeply troubled by his role in all of this. It was his idea to pair Ahsoka with Anakin all those years ago, seeing it as a necessary test for them both. But this outcome was the worst possibility of all. Yoda feared his plan worked only to devastate these two, making each feel more alone and upset with the Jedi Order. We see how this haunts Yoda during his trip to the font of the Metachlorians, the home of the Living Force, mirror to the cosmic force world of Mortis. Qui-Gon Jinn spoke to Yoda through the Force, encouraging him to come here and learn the secrets of retaining your identity after death, persisting in the Force and aiding the light. Like we saw in Mortis, here Yoda would be tested with a series of intensely realistic visions. In one of them, he rushes into the burning Jedi Temple, seeing dead Jedi strewn about. No sign of life from masters or younglings. He is confused and saddened, but he hears noises and rushes over to Ahsoka. Writhing on the floor in pain, she begs Yoda for answers, fearful of what will become of her now that she will die alone in the Force, no longer a Jedi. But the Council expelled me. Why would you do that? <coughs> Will I still become one with the Force when I die? Padawan, Padawan, Ahsoka, no, 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 not strong enough I was. No, failed I have, failed them all. The pain in Yoda's voice shows how deeply he was hurt by her expulsion, a vision of what little Soka's final moments would be like if she died out there in the galaxy at this time of war. No master and no order to look after her. He would then be provided with another vision of an alternate reality where the war never happened. He is filled with joy at seeing Ahsoka hanging out with the other Jedi. Even his old Padawan Dooku is here. But despite the happiness that this vision filled him with, he knew this was not true. And as this adventure does provide Yoda with the tools to survive his bodily death, he also comes to realize and accept that the death of the Jedi Order is imminent. Just as Qui-Gon's spirit lived on, even after his body had become ash, the spirit of the Jedi would not die. It would live on in the galaxy in the hearts of those like Ahsoka. And while no one knew where she was, her legacy was still helping the Republic. In an instance in which Padme and Anakin were allied to Commander Thrawn, Padme tells him of the tactic called the Marg Sable. This was Ahsoka's name for the maneuver over Ryloth. General Skywalker said he'd be a one-man Marg Sable, Thrawn reminded her. What did he mean? It's a battle tactic invented by his former Padawan apprentice. A warship turns its hangar bay away from its attacker and launches its fighters unseen. Thrawn employed Ahsoka's tactics so successfully that it would be a maneuver he would come to rely on many times in his naval career. And on Utapau, we see that Kenobi is trying to help Anakin cope with his loss. I miss her, okay? Is that what you wanted me to say? She made the decision, Anakin. Well, what choice did we give her? The moment there were any suspicions about her loyalty, the Council turned their back on her. He stressed that while mistakes were made on all of their parts, it is Ahsoka who made the ultimate choice. He even goes so far to say that she failed as a Jedi. Part of the Jedi way is not letting emotion cloud your better judgment. And that's precisely what Ahsoka did even in her most critical moment. And we even see how her decision makes Anakin wonder what his master would think if he ever left the Order. You took me under your wing and practically raised me. I'm your Padawan, just like Ahsoka was mine. How well would you sleep knowing I failed you? Not very well, I imagine. Meanwhile, Citizen Ahsoka was simply trying to lay low and make ends meet. 
just days before the end of the Clone Wars, we see her traveling through Coruscant on a junky old speeder bike. When it malfunctions, she is sent sputtering out and crashing into oncoming traffic as she plummets towards the infamous 1313, where a mechanic hears Ahsoka talking about everything that was wrong with the bike. Sounds like you know a thing or two about engines. Trace would let her use the shop to get the speeder bike working, but the questions into her background were making the fallen Padawan nervous. I need to get out of here. Why? You running from something? Walking out of the shop to clear her mind, she stares at a Gazanti class that was doing surveillance in the area, a Republic ship and reminder of the life she left behind. Composing herself, she goes in to see that Trace had completed all the repairs for free. And she says that whatever Ahsoka is afraid of topside, she can hide from down here. I'm sure you have your problems up there, with the Jedi running around, starting wars. But they are interrupted by debt-collecting thugs. And once the fight looks like it was turning against Trace, Ahsoka steps in and shows everyone that she's not just some helpless soul in the lower levels, catching the attacker's fist and scattering them with a painful display of her martial arts skills. Where did you learn to fight like that? My older brother taught me. These thugs were there because of Trace's older sister, Rafa. As always, she was behind on her payments, but promised a big score was coming. Rafa was much more cynical than her little sister. We can't count on anyone, so we count on ourselves. I know. We see a toilet customer put in order for an illegal droid. She puts Trace and Ahsoka to work, and Tano warns that she must put the restraining bolt on each. And it hits her that this model of binary load lifter droid was the same one that went on the rampage that made her late to the ceremony with Yoda to get the extension to her Padawan braid. A tough memory to suppress, but when one of the droids without the restraint activates, the pair are forced to chase it through the multiple levels of Coruscant's underworld. Trace proves resourceful and brave, trying to deactivate the rogue droid, but as it falls limp and tumbles into the abyss, Ahsoka's quick thinking catches it, but it proves too heavy. Though she was trying to abandon her Jedi life, she had to call on the Force to save Trace's life, pulling the forklift and droid onto the ledge. When they meet back up with Rafa, she sees how the older sister manipulates Trace, always with the promise that salvation is just one job away, buying her loyalty with credits and guilting her into thinking that Rafa is always doing what's best for them. Though Ahsoka is angered by this abuse, she thinks she cannot get involved, saying instead that she should just do the finishing touches on the bike and get going. In the shop hangar, Ahsoka would help work on Trace's starship, the Silver Angel, a craft that was cobbled together from scrap parts, and the way Ahsoka handles the repairs impressed the mechanic, making her ask what academy she went to. Uh, Skywalker Academy. Skywalker. Never heard of it, but what do I know living down here? Rafa returns to tell her that she just hired out the ship for a job the details of which are not explained, and as they make their way off-world, Trace breaks out of the civilian lane and gets hailed by a Venator. Have you lost your mind? This is military airspace. Civilian transports are not authorized to be in this sector. Ahsoka knows the little craft is not really a concern, and urges Trace to just get back in the lane, ignore the comms, and keep moving. While on the bridge of the Venator, we see that Anakin detects a disturbance in the Force. Should I send a detachment, General? No. It's nothing. They would be able to make the jump to hyperspace, but as soon as they arrive, Ahsoka is alarmed. Rafa never told them what they would be transporting, and as soon as she saw it was Kessel, she had a clue. Once they sit down with King Yoruba's Major Domo, Ahsoka gets right to the point, calling out their claim that it was just medicine. Many things can be made out of spice, and they're not all good. The mission continues, sending them to the mine to make the pickup, and Ahsoka has to point out something to Trace. Those are not droids. Their people. Once the Silver Angel was loaded up, Rafa promises that it will be as simple as dropping the stuff off on Obadiah. Tano knows that the Pikes are gangsters, who are known to backstab people, killing transporters, stealing their ships, and all kinds of bad things could happen. While Rafa and Ahsoka argue, Trace goes into a trance, obsessed over the fear that she will lose her ship, the only thing that she was proud of, that she spent years assembling. In a panic, she dumps the spice, and both are upset with her now. What did you do? I dumped the spice. You, you did, did what? what? When they arrive, Ahsoka comes up with a plan to trick the Pikes, but ultimately has to rely on a Jedi mind trick. They were nearly able to pull away, but a powerful tractor beam and security ships quickly shut down any hopes of escape. The trio are tossed into prison to await execution. And when Ahsoka talks about how morally wrong it was to work with drugs and gangsters, Rafa had enough of the high morality. Will you listen to this? We got a regular Jedi here. What if I was? There was a prison break on the surface of Coruscant. Where you live? The Jedi went into action, tried to gain control of the ship. There was a populated landing platform right in the path of the ship, but the Jedi steered it clear of that, right into the portal wall. 
and on the other side of that wall was our home. Mom and Dad saw it coming. They got Rafa and I out, but they weren't so lucky. She said, I had to make a choice, but not to worry. The Force will be with you. Just after this, the guards would come to take Rafa away to be tortured for the information on the Spice's whereabouts. When that didn't work, it was Trace's turn. The younger sister is a bit more crafty, faking that she fainted to grab a blaster and shoot her way out. With Rafa still unconscious, Ahsoka is able to manipulate the lock and free them. They have to sprint through the prison complex, and when the bridge to the city was retracted, Ahsoka would again have to hide her calling in the Force, making the impossible leap and sprinting off before Rafa could ask any questions. They would race through the city and try to find a way off-world. Blaster fire would erupt through the streets, which caught the attention of a hooded Mandalorian. They were able to get onto a speeder, but the sisters were recaptured after this getaway vehicle was shot down. They were set to be executed, but just before the blaster could fire, Ahsoka would rush back on one of the defense craft and scatter the pikes, rescuing the sisters and making a break for the gates. But as it opened, the Syndicate proves why they are one of the most powerful criminal operations in the galaxy. They've had people try to rip them off before, and the trio were tossed back into custody, where Ahsoka shocks everyone. They hid the spice off world. I don't know where. Send them to go get it and give them one rotation. If they don't come back, I'll tell you where their family's from. That should motivate them. Though her move freed the sisters, Rafa decided that they needed to find a way to get back and rescue her. While well, Ahsoka had already used her force abilities to free herself again and stumbled upon an armory, crates full of blasters and explosives, and this Padawan could not resist her Jedi instincts. Might as well do some good. Leaping through the facility, placing thermal detonators, she notices the pikes having a hollow meeting with an important hooded figure, someone who seemed to be ordering them around, and she catches a glimpse of a red skin horned being. Darth Maul was somehow ruling over this syndicate, but before she could hear any more, the fallen Sith detects a presence in the Force and ends his transmission. Continuing her quest to cover the place in thermal detonators, she stumbles upon a terminal with a transmission log. Luckily, she's able to see where Maul's message originated from. Despite many official reports, it was clear that Maul was still on Mandalore. Although it appeared she was able to sneak away before anyone saw her, she's quickly ambushed by the guards and Pike leader. Meanwhile, the sisters were on another part of Obadiah, trying to charisma their way into loading up spice to exchange for Ahsoka's freedom. Their scheme was starting to work, but the Trandoshan Dockmaster wasn't about to be played. A brawl breaks out, resulting in flying fists, kicks, throws, and a couple pipes to the head, but the sisters were ultimately victorious, and they arrive back at the prison just in time to free Ahsoka. Though the crime boss, Marg Krim, wasn't having it. Well, he explained that this Jedi was using them, and they were all seen as Republic agents. The only move left was to kill them. To execute them all. Just then, one of the explosives she laid went off, and during the confusion, they were able to escape back to the Silver Angel. Destroying the Pike defense craft would force them all to trust each other completely, as they pulled off difficult maneuvers through the cavernous terrain. With their survival spirit and her Jedi training, these three were able to make it safely out of this crazy adventure. Though still torn that Ahsoka deceived them, she also can't be upset with her. Ooh, you're not going to arrest me for spice smuggling? Why would I do that? Well, you're a Jedi, right? And we see that even with the cynical Rafa, she actually wishes the galaxy was full of Jedi like Ahsoka. Let me level with you. You might not think of yourself as a Jedi, but you act like one. Or at least how I want them to be. While they are talking, a group of Mandalorians emerge from the shadows. Ahsoka recognizes Bo-Katan's helmet and voice instantly. The last time they met, Death Watch was trying to kill her, but this warrior hoped the Jedi would become her ally. She is given five minutes to respond, confiding in the sisters that this was what she feared, that somehow she would be pulled back into the Clone Wars. But if I go down this path, I'm afraid where it might lead. You mean, back to the Jedi? Yes. At the same time, her master was on Yerbana, fighting through the endless swarms of clankers. He, Kenobi, the 501st, and 212th were able to pull off another victory in what would prove to be the final moments of the war. And as Anakin was rubbing in the fact that he had saved his master again, Admiral Yularen contacted them with a code usually employed by Saul Guerrero from Onderon. We've received a transmission from someone using our subspace frequency, Fulcrum. This was an odd request from the Admiral, and so racing back to the Bridge of the Venator in orbit, Skywalker is curious to find out what was the big deal. Hello, Master. It's been a while. Ahsoka. Wow. <laughs> I don't believe it. How are you? Where are you? Are, are you okay? Okatan was the head of the Night Owls, a faction of Death Watch that separated from Pre Vizsla when Maul took the throne of Mandalore. These Mandos had been conducting extensive recon on the Sith and thought they could eliminate him with the help of the Republic. 
Ahsoka knows how much the Jedi Order fear Maul, unsure if he was the ultimate Sith Lord behind the entire Clone Wars, or somehow a different threat from Dooku entirely. But a Sith Lord on the throne of Mandalore would be a concern to the Republic as well. If Ahsoka hadn't left the Order, then she wouldn't have been where she needed to be. That's one way to look at it, I suppose. It's the only way to look at it. Notice Anakin smile as he awaits the return of his apprentice, and R2 could not contain himself, rushing out to welcome Ahsoka back. But her master's excitement was cut short. I'm so glad- We'll have to catch up another time. We see how hurt and confused he was at this reunion, not going as he had envisioned. Bokatan gives the details to Kenobi, showing that they know the strength of the Death Watch reworked Maul DeLoreans in the exact location of the Sith. With their extensive knowledge of the city, palace layout, etc., they just needed the added firepower and troopers that the Republic could supply, and this could be a relatively quick and easy victory. Kenobi is cautious, and despite bo pleas, he simply states that they will relay this plan to the Council. The Mandos would leave as well, with Ahsoka and Anakin finally alone together to talk after all this time. You two certainly haven't changed. Is that a bad thing? Come on, I have a surprise for you. As they head down the passageways of the Venator, Ahsoka is uncomfortable with the clones still treating her as a superior. We see the boys of the 212th were saluting her, not just the 501st who she had fought along the most, but all the clones throughout the Grand Army of the Republic knew of the heroics of the little Togruta. Arriving at a hangar, Ahsoka is stunned by what she sees. Company! Attention! The blue painted boys of the 501st were now sporting orange painted helmets in the style of Ahsoka's face markings. She had felt abandoned by everything and everyone besides Anakin, but as she walks through the ranks, she sees just how much the 501st and Rex loved and missed her as well. Thank you, but you don't have to call me Commander anymore. Sure thing, Commander. As Anakin is about to reveal his next surprise, the klaxon alarm sounds and the personnel all scramble to their battle positions. Kenobi rushes in to tell them that the CIS had just launched a major attack on Coruscant. Grievous had captured the Chancellor, and this may prove to be the final major battle of the Clone Wars. The Republic would either fall, or the CIS would lose their leadership and a massive portion of their fleet, giving the GAR the chance to roll this into a surrender from the Separatists. But Ahsoka is unimpressed, shocked that they would turn their back on the Mandalorian people and leave Maul in place. That as usual, you're playing politics. This is why the people have lost faith in the Jedi. I had too until I was reminded of what the Order means to people who truly need us. I'll divide the 501st, make a new division under Ahsoka's command. We'll promote Rex to commander and have him lead the new division. Ahsoka can go with him as an advisor. Kenobi agrees with this unconventional yet practical solution. Anakin would have to let Ahsoka rush off into danger again, after only having reconnected with her for a few minutes. But he has full confidence in her. Thanks for the support, as always. That's what friends are for. Before they separate, he has to give her his gift. Opening this simple wooden box, we see her lightsabers have been refurbished. The chrome shining on her standard and Shoto sabers, though we see Anakin could not resist putting his own touches on them. She ignites them and is surprised to see a change from her iconic green and yellow combo to a bright blue like the blade of her master. They would have to depart, and we see the very last words between Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano. Anakin! Good luck. While many Jedi Masters taunt that there was no such thing as luck, this pair knew that luck was a pretty good way to describe the mysterious ways in which the Force worked. And with that, they were off. The Master to Coruscant, and the once Padawan to the Civil War-torn world of Mandalore. As soon as the trio of Venators emerged from hyperspace, the LAAT transports and carriers with ATTE walkers would flow from their hangars. Maul's puppet ruler, Prime Minister Almec, hails the invading forces, and bo makes a declaration of war. Ahsoka likes what she sees, and notes the difference in leadership styles from Bo's late sister Satine Kreese. You're nothing like your sister. The Republic forces start taking heavy losses due to the super commandos and missile firing jetpacks, which allow them to fly in squadrons and act as incredibly nimble anti-aircraft forces. Many gunships are lost and even boarded, but bo mandos are trained in this art as well. Even the clones were sporting jetpacks for this invasion, though Rex has to tell Ahsoka that they don't have one for her. Don't need one! You can hear in Rex's laugh that he loves to have Ahsoka back, as this invasion was a lot like the invasion of Teth, and later when she led the jump on Skytop Station. Tano would leap from ship to ship as they made their descent, hijack super commandos and use their jetpacks, all in a graceful and deadly display of her abilities. The Maul DeLoreans on the landing pad would be easily eliminated, and Ahsoka would have to inform Rex of his loss. Beat you. 
Some things never change. The red and black painted traitorous Mandos would put up a hard fight for the city, killing many clones with their unique arsenal of shields and explosives. But Olmec gives the command to Gar Saxon to retreat into the sewer systems. With this portion of the capital taken, Rex and Ahsoka are still cautious about this victory, knowing that Maul's machinations are always complex. I'll head for the throne room and deal with Olmec. You must find Maul. bo and her forces would storm the throne room, making quick work of Olmec and his guards. The coward would attempt to insult her and her late sister Satine, but Catan stays focused and demands the location of Maul. Olmec admits that the Sith wanted the Republic to invade, though he noted that they brought the wrong Jedi. Bo is horrified to find out that she has sent Ahsoka into a trap, but the sewage ways are blocking the comm systems. Deep below the city, Tano is leading orange and blue troops of the 332nd Company through the maze of passageways, while Maul's super commandos track their every movement. In a split second, Ahsoka is able to detect their presence in the Force and is able to guide an incoming rocket off its path, though it does work to separate her from her troops. The clones would be killed while trying to pursue the enemy, and once in an opening, Ahsoka would be surrounded by Mandalorians. I was hoping for Kenobi. Why are you here? Ahsoka's comm was able to be detected by Rex in another part of the tunnels. As the clones blast many of Maul's guards away, he calmly engaged her in saber combat, before using the force to hurl Rex against Ahsoka and run away. They tried to chase after him, but for now he was lost. In the combined forces forward base, Rex, Ahsoka, and Bo reach out to Kenobi. He mentioned a name, Darth Sidious. Darth Sidious is the Sith Lord who orchestrated the Clone Wars and played both sides of it from the beginning. And Obi-Wan tells the story of how he learned this name from Dooku on Geonosis, just moments before the outbreak of the Clone Wars. And that other evidence had pointed to this third, even less understood Sith Lord that was the true puppet master all along. Dooku could no longer provide any details on this, since Anakin had just killed him. If they were to learn more of this Darth Sidious, Maul would be their only hope. Ahsoka hopes this means they will get reinforcements, but Kenobi explains that he cannot send anyone, and Anakin too is on a special mission. He is to spy on the Chancellor, the man that was a lifelong friend and mentor, and Ahsoka can't believe that Obi-Wan would ask her to try and support this, to contact Anakin and talk him out of his protests, to side with the Council. The Chancellor has been a great friend and mentor to Anakin. I can't imagine he is happy about this. So perhaps it's best that you do speak with him. And what? Defend the Council's actions? I hardly think I'm the best person for that. Their conversation is interrupted when Rex runs in to report that Maul's forces had just launched a counterattack. She runs off, but turns back to Kenobi for one last remark. Tell Anakin. I will. What she wanted to say is unclear, but Obi-Wan was with Anakin before he would fall to the dark side. It is before a later hollow report, and would be in the right place to occur after this conversation with Ahsoka. He says many things that could have been what Ahsoka wanted to express as well. That he was a powerful and wise Jedi, but that he must be patient. Goodbye, old friend. May the Force be with you. Note that Kenobi ends with goodbye, old friend, and the name of this previous episode is Old Friends Not Forgotten. So something in this final conversation may have been influenced by Ahsoka. Or it was to say that she would not leave him this time, as the next time we see him, this is what she says. With that, she rushed with Rex back down into the sewers. Arriving on the scene, she recognizes one of the troopers. Sterling, isn't it? The wounded clone is in a panic, telling Ahsoka that Maul had slashed through them and took Jesse alive. With the fallen Sith, we see that he was able to use the Force to pull information out of Jesse, learning all he could about this Ahsoka Tano. Who is this Ahsoka Tano? They know that searching this maze of tunnels is hopeless. Instead, she, Rax, and Bo head to the main detention center to interrogate Olmec. He explains that Maul was going mad, plagued by some impending event, and that a name kept coming to him. It was not Sidious, but before he could say it, Gar Saxon is able to fire off two rounds into Prime Minister Olmec's chest. With his final breaths, Ahsoka is able to get the surprising answer. Sky Uga. The assassin would be pursued, but he too would escape. And with Maul, we hear him giving a rousing speech that would lead these Mandos to their death. If you die, I promise you, it will be on the field of battle. You will die. As warriors. Topside, the leaders of this combined force look upon the war-torn city, where Republic forces are rounding up civilians to put them in camps. This is said to be for their protection, to evacuate them from the war zone, but Bogotan knows Mandalorian sensibilities would not accept this for long, forcing Ahsoka to calm her down. The Republic forces will depart. 
once we capture Maul. Then you will have your opportunity to lead. They would debate as they walked into the throne room, where Maul was seated upon his throne. Bo would rush forward with her blaster pistols firing, but this was no challenge to the Darksider. The Zabrak would return Jesse, leading Ahsoka to tell Rex to leave with him. And once the city erupts, both Maul and Ahsoka agree Bo should go lead her Mandalorian forces. Now alone with this elusive Sith, Tano tries to ply him for information. Though Maul is open about everything, explaining the role of Sidious and Maul's plan to defeat him. The time of the Jedi has passed. They cannot defeat Sidious. But together, you and I can. As the fighting came closer to the palace, Ahsoka made her decision. A rejected Jedi Padawan and Sith Apprentice would combine their forces to destroy the true Sith Master. But she has one final question. What do you want with Anakin Skywalker? He has long been groomed for his role as my master's new apprentice. I know Anakin. Your vision is flawed. The one thing she could not believe was that her beloved friend and master could ever fall to the dark side. If Maul was wrong about this, he could be wrong about anything. Maul sees that this door has closed, and the room is filled with a flurry of double-bladed red saber strikes and dual blue blades. Both with their own difficult and rare fighting styles, they seem evenly matched, forcing Maul to flee through the palace window. Scaling the hanging skyscrapers and sprinting across the rooftops, he makes it to the metal beam lattice structure that supports the dome that covers the city. We could have destroyed Sidious! Only for you to take his place! Again, they would engage in saber combat. This time, Maul would get the better of her, stripping away Ahsoka's blades and trapping her on a separate beam. Just one saber strike and she would fall to her death. But they had never fought before this day and he didn't realize that this is one of the most quick and agile fighters the Order ever produced. Moving past him and grasping his blade, she is able to get him on the wrong side of the beam and slice through it, causing him to plummet to the city below. Ahsoka calling on the Force to suspend him in air as the LAATs close in on Maul. Screaming and wishing to die, Rex would be the one to fire the stun bolt that finally brings the elusive Sith into custody. Ahsoka and Rex having come a long way from that first meeting on Christophsis. The following morning, Bo-Katan would return Ahsoka's sabers. As they look over the battlefront, they discuss how things will need to change in the coming time of peace. Your people need a new kind of leader. Rex would inform Ahsoka that the council was ready to hear her report, and she asks about Skywalker right away. Though her old master was there when Rex left, when they return, Anakin is gone. While the council congratulates Tano on the victory, I did my duty as a citizen. Not as a Jedi. No. Not yet. It is interesting to note that she was considering a return to the Order, just not yet. When she asked for more information on Skywalker and the Chancellor's recent actions, she is shot down by Mace Windu in a way that is shocking even to Rex. I'm sorry, citizen. These matters are for the Council to discuss. While the other Masters cut off the transmission, Yoda stays, smiling with big, hopeful eyes as he talks to Ahsoka, seeing if there was anything else he could help her with. No, Master. Thank you. I'll tell him myself when I see him. As they leave, Rex is confused as to why she did not tell the Council about Sidious and Skywalker, but she gives no explanation for her reasoning, though we can likely assume she feared how the Council would treat her old master after hearing about Maul's vision. She knew firsthand how quick the Council was to jump to conclusions. Tano would accompany Rex in the 332nd Company as they transported Maul back to Coruscant. All while the fallen Sith was safely entombed in a Mandalorian-made device that could negate the powers of Force users, Ahsoka having proved a valuable ally to the true Mandalorians. Goodbye, Ahsoka Tano. As a Jedi, we were trained to be keepers of the peace, not soldiers. But all I've been since I was a Padawan is a soldier. I've known no other way. Gives us clones all a mixed feeling about the war, but without it, we clones wouldn't exist. They salute each other, but are interrupted by a communication. Maul and Ahsoka hear Anakin's fall to the dark side, as he chose to protect the Chancellor instead of Windu. As she goes to tell Rex that she was worried about Anakin, she can sense something is off. Her friend is trembling, and the other clones raise their blasters to her. I'll do it. Rex, 
What's happening? Finding control of the inhibitor chip, he was able to give her a clue to understanding this apparent betrayal. Find him. Vars. Find him! The bolts would come flying at her, but without even knowing it, Rex and her old master had prepared her for this moment. From her days of just a single green blade, to her dual-wielding style in the final weeks with Skywalker, they had put her through intense training, simulating being surrounded by foes on all sides. Perfectly in tune with her training, her body, the blades, and the force, the bolts would all be deflected with her confident flurry of the sabers, sending them into the ceiling above, melting away an opening for her to escape through. Rex would command his men to go execute Maul, and CT-7567 would say something that he would never expect to come out of his lips. We know Ahsoka Tano's on board. She's been marked for termination by Order 66. In his chamber, Maul was helpless, squirming at the thought that after all his efforts, he would be simply gunned down by a couple of Coruscant guards. But his savior was the expelled Jedi. She knocked the clones out and cautiously set him free. Brilliant. Turned the Jedi's own army against them. Ahsoka has not put it together yet, but Maul sees this was his master's plan all along. Back on his feet, Maul is eager to explain how they can ally and rush to defeat Sidious, but this was not her intent. I need a diversion, and you're it. Maul would wreak havoc through the ship, while Ahsoka tried to find a way to look up anything she could about Fives. Rushing into a terminal, as the luck of the Force would have it, she finds her old R7 droid. And once it and the other droids are activated, we see that even the astromechs have not forgotten her loyalty. Ahsoka was kind to the droids under her service, and with their help and Anakin's codes, she is able to access a concealed file, one where Rex is reporting on what happened in the death of Clone Trooper 5s. Inhibitor chips the Kaminoans put inside us have a purpose that we don't yet fully understand. Maul was killing clones by the dozens, allowing Ahsoka and the droids to launch their plan. Rex was captured and brought to the medbay, where medical droids would do their best, but even the facilities on Kamino could not initially locate the chip. An atomic scan was required in the case of Fives, but with the clones working their way through the door, Ahsoka would have to rely on the Force. I am one with the Force, the Force is with me. The chip was spotted, and surgery began while the troopers were blasting away at Ahsoka. Her skills were able to block most, but she was fading. One bolt struck her, and it looked as if this was the end until blue bolts started firing towards the clones. Rex is forced to fire on his brothers to save his innocent commander. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, kid. I'm okay. He is happy she is alive and glad to be free of the chip, but tries to get Ahsoka to realize how evil this plot is. That every single clone trooper in the entire Grand Army of the Republic had these biochips placed in their brains, all for the eventual plan to turn on the Jedi Order. Her brothers could not be reasoned with, or expected to do anything but try and kill her. Despite this, she refuses to use lethal force, knowing they too were just victims of Darth Sidious. Rex would fire his pistols in a barrage of stun bolts, while Ahsoka used the force to knock them unconscious. With his stolen comm link, Maul is able to track Ahsoka's movements through the ship. He cannot allow it to arrive on Coruscant, and makes a run for the main reactor and hyperdrive systems. His immense strength in the force allowing Maul to rip apart these massive structures, causing chain reactions across the entire ship, and pulling them all out of hyperspace. Ahsoka and Rex make it to the bridge, but open the main reactor to find they are on a crash course with an unidentified world. With Rex's traitorous choice, Jesse was now the acting commander. My brothers are willing to die and take you and me along with them. She knows how torn Rex is, one of the most loyal troops in the entire army, who had to watch traitors like Slick and Pong Krell, and now he would be hunted and killed by his own brothers. Rex had to come to terms with the fact that the Republic was ruled by an evil Sith Lord, and that he would be the one seen as a traitor by the entire GAR. But for Ahsoka, there was only one choice. They may be willing to die, but I am not the one who is going to kill them. Though with their droid allies, they had a plan. Rex would try to present her as being captured, while the astromechs prepped a shuttle and got in position to drop the troops into the repair bay. Once they sprung into action, Maul would rush onto the shuttle while the troops were busy with the traitors. Rex tried to hold them off, but he was being overwhelmed, forcing Ahsoka to use her sabers to carve them away to the repair bay. This brought them right back into the area with the troopers, though the trusty droid struck again. While the ship was in flames, the pair raced past all the damaged fighters and bombers. Eventually, Rex spotted a Y-Wing that was still operational. Ahsoka would force push Rex into the bomber and try to deflect the bolts until she saw a chance to join him. But more systems were failing as the Venator was being ripped apart in atmosphere, causing another explosion that sent everyone off their feet. 
Desperately, she tried to use her sabers to climb her way back to Rex. And just as it was released, another explosion separated Ahsoka and sent the Y-Wing tumbling into the stream of smoke and debris. Rex's excellent piloting, Ahsoka's calm and athleticism, and perhaps a little good luck from the Force, allowed her to make it into the turret gunner seat. Years earlier, during the Battle of the Malevolence, Ahsoka's first time in real starfighter combat was in the turret of a Y-Wing. Now with Rex as pilot, it would safely make it down to the surface, and it would be some time before the Republic forces would make it to their location, giving Rex and Ahsoka enough time to collect all their brothers, giving each of them a proper funeral. A graveyard topped with the orange Tano Trooper helmets, and the resting place of close 501st friends like Jesse. She would bury her blades alongside the mass grave, while Rex would tell the Empire that he was the only survivor, that Ahsoka and all of his brothers had died in the crash. Without anyone to report how Rex defied Order 66, he would go back to military service with the Empire. And when Darth Vader came to personally inspect the site, we see he was able to locate the buried sabers, relics from a past, symbolic of his dream come true, that Ahsoka would come back, that she could return as his Padawan, one of the last glimpses of hope in the final moments of Anakin's life. But now Anakin's gift was seized by Darth Vader, as his attention is drawn upward. Light shines through his helmet and we see the blue eyes of a man thought dead. As he gazes on the bird used to symbolize the daughter, the light side of the force, the being that he, no, that Anakin, had once so desperately pleaded with to save Ahsoka's life. I think this would be a good place to pause. Going from her revival on Mortis, Anakin channeling himself in the Force to save her life, ending with Ahsoka losing her life as a Jedi, the growing tensions between the Chosen One and the Order, exacerbating his fears, leading to hatred in the dark side. Darth Vader killed her old master, and a part of this Sith knew that Ahsoka was still alive, somewhere out there in the vast galaxy. In the next episode, we'll see how she lived on after Order 66, fighting Inquisitors and eventually helping give rise to the Rebel Alliance all while never losing hope that Anakin Skywalker could be saved. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Please hit that like button, it really is the best way to help me out. And check out the links in the description for discounts on Star Wars books and audiobooks, other complete playlists and cool stuff. But most important of all, remember, the Order had it coming, and the Force will be with you, always.